Welcome back to Reading with Mrs. H. I am Mrs. H. That's Sammy, and we are reading Ms. Bixby's Last Day by John David Anderson. The next chapter is Brand. He fell, and it ruined everything. The second fall was worse than the first. The first wasn't his fault. The first was an accident. Blame the scaffold. Blame the faulty bolts holding it together. Blame God, maybe, if that's your thing. But I couldn't blame Dad. Not for that one. The second fall was much slower, but somehow, to me at least, it hurt a whole lot more. Unlike the first fall that broke his spine, my dad's other fall, the downward spiral that came after, was harder to measure. But I sense it happening every day. The first few months back at home were right out of daytime talk shows or reality TV. Inspirational moments with Oprah or whatever. There were interviews with the paper. Dad and me on the local news. Even a visit from last year's Miss Decatur County. Who kissed my father on the cheek for the cameras. Neighbors we'd never bothered to get to know left casseroles on our doorstep like peace offerings. The phone rang off the hook with well-wishers. Reverend Galbraith of the local Methodist church stopped by for a visit, which was funny since my father hadn't stepped foot in a church since he was baptized. The construction company my father worked for sent fresh flowers every day for a week. The local auto body shop volunteered to put a hand-controlled accelerator slash braking system in our car so that dad could still drive even without the use of his legs. The insurance company consulted with us I'm sorry, consoled us with warm smiles and promises of monthly direct deposits. The medicine chest was stuffed. Dad took it all all in stride, but a bum like he's making a joke. He was pretty gracious. He forgave the construction company for making him paraplegic, though not legally, of course. Legally they were still very much to blame. He ate the casseroles and took all the medicines in their proper dosages, and did his physical therapy. He made progress, recovering a little function in his legs. The doctors were pleased, full of cautious smiles and hearty handshakes. There was a good chance, with a lot more physical therapy and rehabilitation, that Abe Walker would get the use of his legs back. It would have made a great headline for the local section of the paper, Walker Walks Again. Then it all started to slide. The casseroles dwindled. The newspaper, news reporters found something else to talk about. The woman who rescued the drowning puppies, the couple with the sex tuplets, appointments were missed. Some of the medications were ignored. Others were taken a little more regularly than they should have been. The voicemail filled up with doctor's office reminders. My father adapted to his new life. We put a mini fridge next to the recliner, itself sitting next to the wheelchair. Our cable plan was upgraded to add more channels. The medicine chest got moved to a big white plastic basket by the fridge. Days passed, then weeks, then months. The bills got paid through direct withdrawals. The television stayed on for 24 hours. I started doing everything around the house. I learned how to use the stove burning myself only once, bad enough to leave a scar on my hand. I learned how to do laundry, folding the sheets the best I could, though I only changed them on my bed. Dad, Dad slept on his chair most nights. Some weeks didn't get things didn't get done. Scrubbing the toilets, taking out the recycling, writing my school science report. I changed the light bulbs in the three rooms we used. The insurance company deposited the checks. I did the dishes. Dad sat and watched the History Channel. Deposit, wash, sit, watch, withdrawal, repeat. For a while, I tried. I asked him if he wanted to go out. I told him I would help him with the walker or even push him in the chair. We could drive to the movies or just go to the pool and let fish deal our worms. We wouldn't have to go far. Wouldn't even have to see anyone if he didn't want to. Dad wasn't exactly comfortable around people the way they kept looking at his legs, like they were afraid they'd leap out and bite them or something. 
It could just be the two of us. Maybe later, he said. Maybe later came and went. On Meet the Teacher night this year, I walked myself into the school. I sat with Topher and his parents, and they bought me a Fox Ridge Wildcats bumper sticker to put on our car that never moved. We ate cheap hot dogs and cookies in the cafeteria. That night, Ms. Bixby introduced herself to me for the first time. She was wearing a crimpy yellow dress that sounded like sandpaper scratching when she walked, and her band of pink hair had been tamed with a clip. She shook my hand and asked me if I was there by myself, and I said yes. She said that was all right, that she would help me, that if I needed anything at all, to just ask her. For the record, I never did. Ask her, that is. She volunteered. For the record, it was all her idea. I should have come alone. That's all I can think as we board the bus. That if I had just come by myself, it wouldn't matter if I went through with it or not. Nobody would know. Not even Miss Bixby. But the truth is, I was scared. Afraid of what she would think if it was just me. That she would get the wrong idea. Scared of what she would look like. Scared that she might be hooked up to all those machines, tubes in her arms, snicked up to her nostrils, pulsing, beeping, wheezing. Scared that she would look like my father right after the accident. Practically bolted to his bed, unable to move for fear of damaging his spine any further. Drinking ice water through chapped lips, blinking at me through scared, swollen eyes, wanting to know what happened. Then I remember what she told us about how she would spend her last day. And I thought, this is it. This will be perfect. We can make it perfect. But I couldn't do it by myself. I knew as soon as I told them my idea that Topher would go for it. It was an adventure. And even if it wasn't, he could turn it into one. And if he was in, Steve was in. Because if I had learned anything about the two of them, it was that Steve worshipped Topher. The same way Topher worshipped every comic book hero he'd ever met. Besides, I knew Ms. Bixby meant something to them, too, though it wasn't quite the same. It couldn't possibly be the same. I didn't understand why I needed to go, but that wasn't their... I'm sorry, they didn't understand why I needed to go, but that wasn't their fault. I never bothered to explain. Not just about Ms. Bixby, but all of it. Why I'm always asking... If I can come over to their house on the weekends instead of the other way around. Why I always need a ride if we go somewhere. Why I sometimes punch the walls at school hard enough to skin my knuckles. I never bothered to explain why I needed to see her so bad. Of course, it doesn't matter now. We get on the bus that will take us back to school. Steve helping Topher up the steps. <clears throat> it's hard to tell how much his ankle hurts him. He can be pretty melodramatic. But I can tell it's swollen. He could probably use an ice pack and some painkillers. If he were at my house, he'd be set. One oxycodone would do it. My father wouldn't miss it. He's got a three-month supply. Topher takes an empty seat and motions for Steve to sit next to him. He's mad at me. Topher, for yelling at him, for giving up. Maybe even about the sketchbook still. Steve doesn't seem angry. He just looks worried, like always. I sit in the empty seat across from them, but scoot all the way over, leaving room for an imaginary fourth person between us. The fourth musketeer, maybe. But really, I just need some space. Steve gets on his phone, mutters something about the battery being nearly dead, then shuts it off and stuffs it back in his pocket. Without it, his hands don't seem to know what to do. They start fiddling with the zipper on his backpack. I shift and look out the window, press my face up against it. My cheeks are hot and wet, and the glass is cool, and I can feel the vibrations of the bus's engine rattling. Bus's engine rattle my teeth. It's still. It's quiet, save for the bus's rumble. Nobody on the bus is talking. That's absolutely fine. I'm used to the quiet. I've learned to cope without conversation. Even on those Friday evenings with Miss Bixby there, would sometimes be stretches of silence, riding in her car, watching the sky change colors, and thinking that I wasn't ready to go home, even though I knew I had to. 
Those days with her felt different. They felt better. It felt like I was in some magical place where time stood still, where nothing bad could happen. They were almost perfect. That's what today was supposed to be. That's what hurt so much. Across the aisle by the opposite window, Topher leans his head back. He glances over at me as if confirming that I'm still there and then looks straight ahead. Who do you think would win in a fight? Wolverine or Captain America, he says. He's not talking to either of us in particular. He's just throwing it out there, cutting the silence, filling the space. I keep my head pressed to the window, making wishes on passion, passing cars. I mean, Wolverine's claws could probably cut just cut straight through Captain's shield. When do you think, he adds. I don't respond. I won't respond. But naturally, Steve takes the bait. Doubtful, Wolverine's claws are made out of ad adamantium. Captain America's shield is made out of proto-adamantium, proto which is better than regular adamantium. This is the reason you will never have a girlfriend, I think. But I wouldn't say so that to Steve. He doesn't seem that all that interested in girls anyway. Yes, Topher said, still looking at the seat in front of him. But you're forgetting the awesome factor. Captain America's a goody-two-shoes dweeb with goofy little wings on his head that don't even let him fly. Wolverine has killer sideburns and a better backstory. Wolfie, Wolfie beats him on a coolness alone. Superheroes are not traditionally rated on their coolness, Steve says. Everyone is rated on their coolness, Topher replies. What about Thor versus Cap? Thor's a god, Steve replies. He can beat up anybody. So does that mean he could beat up Jesus, Topher presses? I laugh. Okay, I don't really laugh, but I'm, I sort of snort at least. Even that, enough that Topher knows I'm listening. He doesn't look at me, but he smiles. I don't think Jesus and Thor would even fight, Steve says. That's not Jesus' style, Topher nods, conceding the point. Part of me wants to ignore them, to keep looking out the window, to shut myself out and be alone. But I can't help it. Topher has somehow suckered me in, too. What if Jesus had Thor's hammer? He was a carpenter, right? Both of them twist around to look at me, a little surprised that I joined the conversation after storming off and shouting at them before. Steve shakes his head. Theologically speaking, Billions of people currently believe in Jesus, and probably only a handful still worship Thor. Advantage, Je advantage <laughs> Jesus. I don't argue. Steve goes to Mass every Sunday, so he probably knows better. Dad had an entire church come to the house once, the whole congregation showing up in a long white bus. It was right after the accident. They stood on our front lawn and sang a song called Rise Up. I don't think they were being ironic. They really thought he might do it. All right, I've got one, Steve says. The Golas versus Hawkeye. Unfair comparison, Topher says. The Golas is immortal. Not if you stick him full of arrows, he isn't, Steve counters. Especially those ones Hawkeye has that explode. You'd have little elf chunks flying everywhere. Elf chunks. For some reason, I find this funny, too. Doesn't matter, Topher says. Legolas is eternal. He doesn't get old. He doesn't get sick. Even if you kill him, his spirit comes back, like Obi-Wan Kenobi. He will live forever, no matter what. As soon as he says it, Topher frowns. Steve pushes his glasses back up his nose. A long silence follows, and I look back out the window and up at the sky. The clouds have cleared out now, making room for an endless waves of blue. I wonder what it is about clouds that makes people think of heaven. Maybe just they're in the way, so there must be something else up there? Suddenly, there is a gurgled growl coming from Steve, loud enough for me to hear from across the aisle. Dude, was that you? Tover asks. I, hadn't, I haven't eaten since breakfast. It's already past noon, Steve says, holding his stomach with both hands like he's afraid it's going to pop out and go looking for food on its own. I guess we didn't think about lunch, Topher says. 
Then he turns and looks down at the floorboards, and I realize what he's looking at. Steve's backpack and the bent white box stuffed inside. $25 is a lot to waste, Steve says. I mean, if nobody else is going to eat it, he meant Ms. Bixby. They, they both look at me because I paid the most for it, or because the whole thing was my idea. The whole cake, the whole everything. She wouldn't want it to go to waste, Topher says. That's true. She was a firm believer in making the most of things. I don't say yes, but I don't say no either. I just shrug. I already feel sick to my stomach. I can't bear the thought of eating anything. The bus pulls up to the next stop, and Steve starts to unzip his pack, shimmying the dilapidated box free. Topher starts to dig in his pack for the plates he brought. We have nothing to wash it down with, just one empty wine glass. I figure I'll try a bite, though, for Miss Bix Bixby's sake, just to see if Eduardo was right. I look over at Steve, who has his hands on either side of the box, but he's not opening it. Instead, he's looking up at the front of the bus. His eyebrows shoot skyward. He drops, slinking, beside the, slinking behind the brown vinyl seat in front of him, pulling Topher alongside and hissing at me to do the same. Get down! Wait, what is it? I duck behind my seat, wondering what in the name of Michelle's white chocolate raspberry supreme cheesecake he saw. Someone from school? A teacher? Mr. Mac? Or maybe it's his parents. They found out he's skipping and are hunting him down. Or maybe the cashier from the liquor store called the cops and they are looking for us. Or maybe it's just Steve's turn to be melodramatic. I peek over the top of the seat in front of me. My jaw drops. I can hardly believe our luck. You could say, Ms. Bixby saved me, but that would be melodramatic. All she did was pick me up. It was all a matter of luck. She found me in a snowstorm, up to my knees, six grocery bags hanging from my arms and wrists. I'm not sure how she spotted me. Probably recognized my coat. Or the hat that I wore, blue with a yellow floppy fuzzball on the top of the giant ear flaps that nearly hit my shoulders, borrowed out of the closet from my dad. She found me and she pulled over and opened her window and called my name. And I didn't want to stop because I figured she would ask me all sorts of questions. It wasn't school, we weren't in class, and I didn't have to explain, to her or to anyone. So I trudged on, pretending not to notice her. But then she honked her horn and leaned over and said, do you need a ride? I wasn't sure what I needed, but I looked at the car with its heater and music both blasting and the mile of foot-high snow I still had to trudge through, and I figured a ride wouldn't hurt. Just this once. And that's how it started between me and Ms. Bixby. She just happened to be passing by. I feel a warmth surge through me. It's him the last one in the line of oncoming passengers, torn jeans and blue shirt, one hand holding a brown paper bag, dragging, clawing its way up his arm. George Nelson, the flipwad who stole our money and ruined our day. But I don't really see him. What I see is Ms. Bixby pulling up alongside the road and asking me if I need a ride. Her tapping on, I see her tapping on the steering wheel to one of her favorite songs. I see her standing over me, both hands on my shoulders, telling me that sometimes you're beat before you even got started. But it doesn't matter. You keep going no matter what. And I realize that day's not over yet. All right, and that's the end of that chapter. All right, we did it too today. <laughs> I hope you are enjoying the story. I don't have a lot to say because I think I already did that in the first video, but... I did switch birds for this video, huh, Sammy? Sammy was getting really jealous. All right. So when the next part is ready, you'll find it right around there. You could click my picture up in the corner if you would like to subscribe. Uh, if you want to share with a friend, please do. Comment if you want. Do all that fun stuff. <laughs> and most importantly, until next time, keep reading.